thank you everybody for coming. Uh, I'm Joe Procopio. Uh, I'm going to be the moderator of the panel. And uh, you'll have to pardon my raspy voice. I've been behind a booth uh, all day uh, chatting with folks. And so I'm very, very raspy. Um, we're going to start with a short, lovely documentary on Richard uh, and his work that was filmed three or four years ago. Uh, a guy named Bob Burnett uh, directed it, uh, and he is the creative director for GVI, which is a video production company here in DC, and uh, he gave us permission to show it, and I think it's really lovely. And uh, so let's start with that. Um, before we start that, just to let people know, the documentary is about 20 minutes long. After that, we'll have basically round table discussion with the panelists. I'll introduce the panelists, and then we'll save a few minutes at the end uh, for folks to use one of the two mics at either side of the room, because I know there are a lot of folks here who actually knew Richard. <laughs> and uh, and uh, I'm encouraging, encouraging folks to get up and share some of their, their uh, experiences with Richard, as well as to just ask any questions of the panelists. That said, why don't we go ahead and start it? <clears throat> we wanted to make sh make sure to include that because it obviously gave you an opportunity to see and hear Richard and uh, it was, uh, you know, a really great great piece. And, uh, uh, so before we start, I'm just going to talk a little bit about uh, my my experience with Richard, and then we'll we'll go to the panelists. Um, but uh, so I'm Joe Procopio, and I'm the founder, uh, publisher, co-founder, and, and co-publisher of Lost Art Books. Um, and we are going to be publishing uh, a series of books called the Richard Thompson Library. Uh, we've got four different volumes in the works right now. Uh, one of them uh, is uh, completing Call the Sack, which is edited by Mike Rohde, who I think is here in the audience. And uh, we're hoping that this one is going to be out uh, in November. Uh, and then shortly after that, we have uh, one that collects all of his uh, cartoons that accompanied a Washington Post column called Why Things Are back in the early and mid-90s. Uh, and so that's going to be the next volume. Then we have another volume on his caricature that will be coming out later next year. Um, so uh, I'm going to have these at our booth, and if anybody wants a little map to our booth, I have some up here, and you can come flip through these and check these out. Um, so I heard about Richard before I met him. Uh, I had a friend who was just a big fan of cul-de-sac and kept talking it up. Uh, and I remember one day when we were at a bookstore and he thrust a volume of it in my hand. And uh, honestly, and to my uh, now embarrassment, I flipped through it quickly. And uh, I think it was just kind of understated and in a busy bookstore, it didn't grab me, it didn't arrest my attention. And, uh, and uh, as I said, that was uh, one of my great failings <laughs> is to not recognize the, the genius immediately. Um, but a couple of years later, in 2010, uh, Lost Art Books has this annual uh, open house party, and a mutual friend, I think, again, I think it was Mike Rohde, uh, brought Richard to the party, and uh, I got to meet him, and uh, we chatted, and uh, he was uh, in person, uh, equally uh, understated, and kind of quiet and low key, and. Uh, and uh, I found out later, sadly, that I, that was probably uh, somewhat uh, attributed to his recent Parkinson's diagnosis then. Um, and uh, I came to discover that uh, Richard uh, is not very discerning when it came to choosing his friends. And eventually, uh, <laughs> I, I was added. <laughs> I, I was added to that circle of friends, uh, which uh, is how I got to meet so many of the, these folks on this panel here, which is uh, fantastic. Um, but my experience with Richard is that he always would rather talk about your work than he would his work. Uh, I put out a couple of books on a German illustrator named Heinrich Klei, and uh, I remember the last conversation I had with Richard before he lost his voice was wanting to talk about those books. Um, I, uh, 
I got to help with scanning some of the art with Nick Galifianakis uh, when they were working on uh, the art of Richard Thompson book. And I remember writing Richard after that experience, telling him how just delightful it was to get to spend a day with stacks of his original art and getting to hold it and see it up close. Uh, and I got no reply at all. <laughs> I was like, OK, so I've inadvertently offended this guy somehow. Uh, but a uh, short time later, we fell into this conversation about classical music. And uh, we had a lengthy, in-depth uh, correspondence about uh, his favorite composers and favorite recordings of uh, different symphonies by different conductors. And uh, you know, he just could talk so uh, so passionately and intelligently on that subject, and and uh, I still have those emails, and uh, those you know I'll just ch I'll cherish that uh, that exchange we had uh, about that. But um, since Richard didn't seem to really like to talk about himself or his work all that much, that uh, leaves that pleasurable task to us. And uh, so we're going to uh, spend uh, a little while here talking about Richard and his work. And let me introduce you to these folks here on the far end, uh, Sheena Wolf, who is uh, the acquisitions is the acquisitions editor uh, for Universal U Click. And you were uh, Richard's editor on Cul de Sac from 2010 until the conclusion of the strip. Um, to my right, uh, in addition to being a personal friend and admirer of Richard's, uh, David Apatoff is a lawyer, author, and reformed cartoonist, um, which I guess is better than being a deformed cartoonist. Um, not by much. Not by much. <laughs> um, and then uh, in the middle here is uh, Nick Galifianakis, uh, an award-winning illustrator and syndicated cartoonist with the Washington Post. He was co-author and editor with David and Bill Watterson of Calvin and Hobbes fame of uh, the book I mentioned uh, from 2014, The Art of Richard Thompson. Uh, and Nick and Richard were very close friends. So why don't we kick things off, and I'm going to start with you, Sheena. And why don't you just tell me a little bit about your first experience or encounter with Richard or his work? OK. Um, the first encounter I had with Richard was actually on email because I was initially his second editor and John Glenn, who's the president um, of Universal U Click, was his first editor and so there's like a main editor and then a backup editor and I got to work with him when John went out of town. So I would get to email him with my notes and apologize for them being in a different format than he was used to and he was always super, super nice about it and, um, and then a, in 2010, I became his first editor, and that's actually, I met him at San Diego Comic-Con right before I became his main editor. And he'd just been diagnosed, so he was still doing pretty well, and he could talk, but he was kind of soft-spoken. And we all went out to dinner, and um, like, and I get really uh, stressed out at San Diego Comic-Con, and I think he was very entertained by how like much I hated everything, and was willing <laughs> to talk about how much I hated everything. and. Um, so that was when I met him in person, and I just thought he was a really funny, interesting person. And um, but primarily, like I knew him through email until then, and then after that, I got to know him a little bit in person. Sheena does hate everything, by the way. I hate everything. <laughs> <laughs> oh, but I would mention um, that my first experience with cul-de-sac was um, that I didn't. Cul-de-sac is not a comic that draws you in. It is a comic that challenges you to understand it and read it and get into it, and it's um, and I love that about it. Like it was, it was like he was writing a comic that was made for people like me. Um, it wasn't, it wasn't easy, and so it was that paradoxical thing where if you would spend the time on it, it was so worth it. But like Joe said, when you first see it, if you don't get, I mean, if you don't spend the time, you wouldn't get it because he wasn't writing for everybody. He was writing for people like him, so. Nick, did you uh, yeah, no, I didn't actually know Richard. <laughs> Rich, Richard who? <laughs> yeah, no, Richard and I met in a bordello after a midget juggling contest. <laughs> we met in the late 80s. Um, I had visited a, a store in Georgetown, a shop, that sold animation drawings. 
cells, but drawings, and I was there looking for a Chuck Jones drawing. And the guy behind me was like, I can't believe that. It, there was somebody in here earlier today looking for uh, Chuck Jones drawings. I said, really? Yes. Because, well, he was a cartoonist too. So maybe I should connect you guys. Back then, we did that. We weren't afraid of, you know, everything that all well, you young people are terrified of today. And so he just uh, gave me his uh, number, and I called him, and we uh, got together for lunch and brought our portfolios. And uh, I've been depressed ever since. <laughs> I met Richard here at SPX. I had known his work for a long time. I'd written about it, but I met him in person here. He was sitting behind a table, and he had four or five of his books all lined up. And I introduced myself, and I said, now, which one of these should I get as a starter to, to learn more about your work? And he went down the line. He said, now, let's see, this first one, now, nah, that's got a lot of repetitive material in it. You don't want that one. And the, the second one, the, the reproduction isn't very good on that one. You probably don't want that one either. And he worked his way all the way down. We got to the end, and he told me not to get any of the books that he was selling here at SPX. That this is one strange dude. So I just I bought them all. I'm impressed. We all told very truncated stories of how we. Uh, yeah. I, I, we, we know the original stories, the whole thing. <laughs> They're very long. And, um, so, you know, there, there's a mention in the in the movie about Richard being sort of a cartoonist, cartoonist, and uh, I, I know that uh, you you folks have some anecdotes about some of the different cartoonists who were fans of Richard's work and and whatnot. And I'm curious to hear some of those stories. Uh, I'll get Actually, those. mine will be the shortest. Okay. You are the shortest. Um, that's fair. Okay. Um, so Richard is one of those people who anytime anyone figures out that I knew him or worked with him, uh, people that I had no idea were familiar with his work, like indie cartoonists or um, fantasy artists or just like this range of people, like any number of people, they were always like, oh my gosh, Richard Thompson, like you know him, and then they wanted to ask questions, and it was, it was something where like, I work for a syndicate, and I know that he wasn't in that many papers, and like, where are you finding him? Like, how did you know? And it was always so great, and it was exciting to hear just anybody. My favorite is Josh Cotter, who was always like, I am such a big fan of his work, um, but I've never met him. And then he would, like, I would just basically take embarrassing stories about Josh Cotter, who Richard has still never met, and is here at SPX, and then tell him embarrassing stories about Josh Cotter for no reason. Because, like, that was, you know, it's, it's people who you would never think would have found his art or be into it, and just everybody. So, that's all. So short. <laughs> that, that, uh, and David, I know you, you might... No, you had. Oh, okay. Okay. Well, um, I, once we made, after we made, of course I've known Richard for decades, and I, I, I know a lot of illustrators, I know a lot of other cartoonists, but sort of it's a very small world when you're in that biz, and, and uh, people who work in the animation industry, <clears throat> but it wasn't, and, and, and he had many, many admirers, and for the right reasons. But it wasn't until I took our book, The Art of Richard Thompson, and I should point out that one of the editors is in the audience as well, Mike Rohde, over there in the corner. Uh, and uh, there was uh, another, along with Bill Watterson, there was also Chris Sparks, and Chris is not here. Um, I took the book on tour to the animation studios. Now, animation studios are chock full. I mean, I don't, I don't know that there's a higher concentration of talent in any institution in the world. People whose work you will never, you'll never see them in museums or in books or anything like that. And they can paint like Vermeer and draw like God. And they're seeing Richard Thompson's work for the very first time. And they're astonished. I was accustomed to artists being amazed. I'm also accustomed to cartoonists who look at his work and go, oh, wow, he's good. And you can just see right away that they have absolutely no idea why he's good. So the tour was very gratifying. It was very satisfying because it got to the ones who know, who know why. They know what it takes to be that. Uh, and they were amazed. And I got some version of this apologetic story. They would buy the book, and they would look at me and bringing it up to me to sign, and they would say, I'm sorry, I, I had no idea. I had no idea. I'm talking about, and also in the world of illustration, I'm talking about the peaks in our craft. 
I'm talking about the ones that people will be discussing 100, 200 years from now. Those people. As Peter DeSev, who is a New Yorker cover artist, pro probably one of the two or three most popular ones, and he's, uh, he, along with Carter Goodrich, are the two most in-demand character designers on the planet, and Richard is their god. So this was, uh, that was, uh, that's been a great thing to experience. I know you want to piggyback you on You want to that. tell them the story about Peter and the elves, the cover? Uh, Do you dare say that in, in go ahead. <laughs> yeah, yeah, now. Well, there's, no, there's kids in the room. <laughs> <laughs> oh, okay. There's a kid in the room, so. <laughs> Are you going to cover his ears? Yeah. Well, uh, what's, his, what's his name? What's your name? Okay, I'm going to say a word that you've probably heard in your house many, many times. <laughs> But don't repeat it, ever. Never. <laughs> so Peter DeSev, who I just described to you, was just inducted into the Hall of Fame Society of Illustrators. And, uh, and <laughs> Richard had just done a U.S. News and World Report cover. Uh, uh, I have the illustration somewhere, I think, um, of uh, sweatshop elves. <laughs> just this beautiful oil painting, stylized, and just this magnificent piece of work and I happened to show it to Richard, uh, to uh, Peter DeSev, you know, Peter, who's world known, you know, he's right, and he just looks at it and he's like, God, you know, fuck Richard Thompson. <laughs> <laughs> it's like, m maybe the second greatest compliment, <laughs> because the first one is, is this, this, uh, illustrator who's the father to many of us, and, and Richard certainly is one of Richard's gods, his name is Ed Sorrell. Ed Sorrell, also many New Yorker covers, one of the, one of the great satirists um, and famously misanthropic curmudgeon, uh, anything but warm and friendly, just not, if you, just not, not that kind of person at all. And he was at a Pat Oliphant opening, and I was there with Richard. And Wendy Reeves, the curator of the National Portrait Gallery, was also there, and she wanted Richard to meet Ed. Well, Ed was one of Richard's heroes, and so you know he, he was dying to meet the guy. Um, and so we were brought up, and Ed was talking to somebody else, and Wendy Reeves says, Ed, I would like you to meet, and Sorrell turns around, surly, Sorrell, just did this perfunctory thing, puts his hand out, and Richard, is like this and puts his you know, hand under their hands touch just as Wendy says, uh, Richard Thompson. And Sorrell went, oh, and grabbed his hand with both of his and kissed Richard's hand. <laughs> I was right there. Yeah, if you uh, read the book, The Art of Richard Thompson, you'll see a long list of the most arrogant, insufferable prima donnas in the <laughs> art field who all had similar reactions. They looked at Richard's work and they acknowledged their master and they were really, they got weak in the knees. So they could really judge quality and yeah. were, were reluctant to acknowledge it, but when they had to, they did. Not a one of them would be sitting in the Fanographics presentation right now. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, thank you all for skipping the <laughs> panel of a lifetime to come attend our panel. Uh, Sheena, I had a question for you. Um, I'd, I'd read where you had sort of talked about Richard's holistic approach to cul-de-sac, and um, I just wonder if you could talk about that a little bit, because I'm not sure what, what that means. Um, it just means that he didn't write a script out and then do a comic. So um, when his line started to get wobbly, we at the syndicate thought, well, maybe he can still write it and somebody else can draw it. And what I found out was that that's not how Richard works. He doesn't write scripts. He does an entire cartoon at once. And so there was really no way to separate his writing from his art, um, which made the strip amazing, but was also um, very frustrating when anyone else uh, had to come in and, and do anything on it. So um, yeah, his, his approach to cartooning, like a lot of people, you, you build a joke, you know, you have like a setup and there's a joke and there's the mechanics of the joke and with Richard's work, there's so much humor in the art and a lot of 
Like you'll see in a lot of comics where the the text is just kind of reiterating what's happening in the art, and, and with a cartoon you have all these opportunities to tell a joke. You have a visual, you know, you have a funny way of drawing, or you have, you know, a visual setup, and you also have the text. And nobody does that quite as well as Richard, um, where everything is efficient, everything is working toward that humor and that sensibility. So there really wasn't any way, like when I became his editor, I wasn't editing his writing. I, I mean, I was write, editing his spelling and his, uh, <laughs> his, and I was editing his handwriting, but I wasn't editing, you know, the gags because the gags were so baked into the whole comic. So that's what I mean right. when I say he had a holistic approach. We were wondering what it was like to edit yeah, Richard we were Thompson. Talking. Yeah, I know. How the that's, hell do you edit Richard <laughs> you Thompson? You don't edit Richard Thompson? Like, okay. when it started, I think there was more, when he had more time, because Anyone will tell you that uh, he needed the deadline. Most people need the deadline. If any of you are cartoonists, I bet you need the deadline too, because I'm an editor and I'm the person who writes. And I was like, it's the deadline. Uh, where's your stuff? So, um, but in the beginning, people start out ahead and then they <laughs> they just get behind. That's how it works. And in the beginning, you do roughs, and so you'll see roughs, and then you'll be able to say like, I don't think that joke quite works, or like maybe this word instead of that word. There was very little of that with Richard. It was pretty much either like. Yeah, that's a really good joke. Oh, that's really a good joke. That's a really good joke. Um, maybe this word instead of that word, but that's a really good joke, like as it is. It's all, so there really wasn't any editing of his stuff. I think the one time I had a major change, it was because like Stacy Curtis, who eventually came in as an inker, um, had misread his handwriting and written uh, Frank list instead of Franz list. And I was like, I'm pretty sure. It's uh, like, but I don't, like, it's being said by a four-year-old, so maybe she doesn't know what his name is. And he's like, no, no, it's, you're right. So that was the one catch that I had, and it wasn't even Richard. So, yeah, you, you don't really edit <laughs> Richard. Yeah, he, he was a perfect uh, creative ecosystem. He was in the, he'd be in the middle of a strip and not know what was going to lead him to the end, the drawing or the idea, the characters and what they were doing. He, he didn't know. It was... Things were so intertwined and overlapped, and he he couldn't separate one, uh, one from the other. It's uh, quite a it was quite a quite a thing to experience. Yes, yeah, it's, uh, it's interesting how much uh, the classical music kind of motifs run throughout uh, his work, which you know I think some of my favorite pieces of his are are the portraits of the different composers and mm -hmm. whatnot. Uh, yeah, which are pretty fantastic. Um, Sheena, can you tell us a little bit about Richard's, or, or any of us actually, any of you? Who talk I'm getting all the questions. You are, <laughs> I'm putting you on the hot seat. Uh, but uh, any of you who want to talk about Richard's decision to end cul-de-sac? I can definitely speak to that um, because the last, I would say the last full year of the strip, maybe even a little longer than that, um, there were a lot of um, just blown deadlines. And uh, my job at that point wasn't really to even do anything with the strip. It was just to make sure that the balance of the work that Richard was doing wasn't ki killing him, <laughs> basically, because he would get really stressed out and he would try to make these deadlines and then you know, he'd lose the line and his hand would start shaking and he just couldn't do it. And so I was basically there to be unflaggingly cheerful and supportive and just like, we'll do subs and it's not a big deal and don't worry and do you wanna try for next week and what do you wanna do? and and just um, like basically being as supportive as possible if, if you know if a corporation can be called supportive. Um, so that was what I did like for the last year. And I would get emails on the weekends and I would get Facebook messages and he would have like moments where he'd be like, I really like, is it terrible for all of you over there? And this is notable because um, no other creative person I have ever worked with was like, how about you guys on the production side? Are you okay? <laughs> like, are you okay? Are we like, or am I driving you crazy? So he was really worried about that. And none of us were bothered by it. Um, like we just wanted him to be as well as he could be and continue doing the comic for as long as he felt it was the right thing to do. So the, the process of ending the comic started probably a year before it actually ended where he started questioning whether or not he could continue doing the comic. And, um, and we, we wanted it to continue for as long as it made sense for him to do it, but we definitely didn't want to push it anywhere beyond there. And there were all sorts of things that we wanted to try, like we wanted to try to bring in other people to work with him on it, and he couldn't do that. Like it wasn't his comic, he couldn't let go of it, 
um, and have, and I mean, I have emails from him that say that too, where like it was his baby and anybody else touching it was not okay. And that was like, that's, it's a weird thing to hear from a business standpoint, just because it could have kept going. And I've had conversations with other people where they were really surprised that he decided to end it, but it needed to be his comic for as long as it could be his comic and then it needed to stop. And so that's what happened. Um, so uh, this, I think he he made the decision to stop it after he had his fall and he announced it to John and Lee and he said in an email to me that uh, he looked terrible and that really helped them not fight him on it because he just looked a wreck. <laughs> and he's like, I look terrible and I will like for $25, I won't send you a picture. Um, <laughs> but I've, I've decided to end the strip and no one is going to question me because I look terrible right now. And I was like, okay, that's, you know, that's fine. And then, um, but that last thing, he really wanted to do a last Sunday and he couldn't get the line done. So um, it ended on, I think one of my favorite rerun Sundays, but now I can't remember which one that was. Right. I think it's oh, important. Oh, and there was another thing about that I always want to talk about and I never get to. Um, when he started, no, like this, this is, I think this is really interesting and it's also a very rigid thing. He was trying to figure out ways to continue drawing the strip even though he couldn't draw as, um, as detailed as he used to be able to. So he has a lot of storylines where Pete goes, Petey goes to cartoon camp and then he had strips that were drawn by the kids and he would have whole weeks of strips drawn by the kids. There was another thing that he did where he said, I think I figured it out. I'm gonna use the same drawing a couple times. And if you have looked at the comics page, everyone has figured that out. <laughs> like everyone has been doing that for a while, but he didn't do that until he had to do that. So those are, those are two small anecdotes. I think it's important to emphasize how rare it is for a successful cartoonist to shut down a strip like that. Mm -hmm. A handful of them, Watterson, Gary Larson perhaps have done it, but most of them are quite happy to find ghost writers and ghost artists and ghost pencil sharpeners to take the strip over while they man the, uh, the cash register. And the fact that Richard could not do that, the fact that he was willing to shut down this thing that meant so much to him, proves that beneath that gentle exterior, he was as hard as diamonds. He had a very tough, demanding standard for quality, and if you couldn't meet it, that was it. Yep. Very tough to do. So, this being Small Press Expo, uh, and there are a lot of uh, young uh, cartoonists here, aspiring cartoonists, uh, is there anything from Richard's career that uh, a young cartoonist could uh, emulate or not emulate? Uh, Look, I, I think Richard was totally unique. And if you walk through the exhibition hall, you'll see all kinds of books about you know, the magic rowboat or the vampire planet or you know, the, the trauma of my adolescence. Um, <laughs> everyone was looking for something dramatic and imaginative to write about because if you write about miracles, it's not hard to find miraculous things to write about. Richard found miracles in blades of grass. Richard would write about taking out the garbage or write about uh, uh, you know, a, a plastic shopping bag caught in the bushes. Uh, he, would, he would find humor in the, uh, you know, the, the class guinea pig at a nursery school and um, his ability to be funnier and smarter with the everyday things around you, I think, put them in a class totally by himself. I don't think that many of the people in the exhibition hall are able to replicate that formula because you need to be a genius to pull it off. Right. So hang it up, guys. <laughs> <laughs> hey, truth hurts. <laughs> well, on that, on that, on a Richard Thompson level, <laughs> but you can, you know, you can, as I would tell all young kids, you can look at Richard and and try to cultivate your own voice, your authentic voice. Richard's fidelity to authenticity was second to nobody's, um, and which is why he, you know, history will record him as such. He's um, he he really did have to be his own thing, tap into his own mind. He competed against himself. Um, as I said again recently, and I actually said a few times, Richard knew he had the goods to be good. Um, and so he knew that who he was comparing himself to was how good he could be. And I walked, I walked through not only this con, but others across 
the country. You go to the and I'm and, 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 seeing all this amazing pr promotional stuff. I don't begrudge anybody anything uh, to, to make money because Richard is not the example you want to look at if you want to make money. <laughs> but um, but it's all just not what it's about. It's it's about being at the drawing board and it's about saying how how good can I be, how good can I be, and how honest can I be? Um, in fact, let me sh show you guys something, just to give you a little visual tap into his mind. This is, this is very informal. I'm sure you can work this now. So in about 10 minutes, we're going to see a slideshow. <laughs> <laughs> it's so worth it. <laughs> is this? Yeah, OK. So, so can you all gather around? <laughs> Yeah. Yeah. Hey. All right. So, Richard started most of his sketchbooks with an elephant, a drawing of an elephant. And, you know, I'm I was supposed to ask a question about <laughs> elephants. So. <laughs> and so I, you know, after going through his, this was actually yeah, years ago. I asked him so a simple question: Why? Why you? Because he said that elephants. Um, didn't look like what you think they did. <laughs> they were preposterous. They were taller than you thought they were. They were thinner than you thought they were. They were, they were more graceful than you thought they were. They had more wrinkles than you thought they, that they did. And this was very interesting to, to Richard. And so it opened a window in, in my, I, I suddenly understood him a little bit better. Richard did not, it, it didn't interpret a living thing. He drew an idea. If you can walk away from something with an idea of what it is, and then that, that, that's not exactly what it is, well, then the sky's the limit. And that's what he did, which is why he would completely invent, you know, there's no bee in nature that looks like this, but it's unmistakably a bee. And that's his rhinoceros. <laughs> and his donkey. And his pig. And his mammoth. Uh, I've showed this to Peter DeSiv, who designed the characters for Ice Age, which of course, you know, the star, a mammoth. And he just talks about how he slaved away. So he goes, he goes that is a mammoth, that's a mammoth. <laughs> Unless you look at this, it's another mammoth and a different pig. But it's all about Richard not saying what does a fort look like. I mean, make a cartoon out of it. It's how do I feel about, how do I, Richard, feel about a fort? And this guarantees an internal interpretation. And then he pulls off the neat trick is that he makes you see it his way. Like the sweatshot elves, or the clown. When this is Amy, his one of Amy's favorite uh, Richard Thompson people, his wife Amy. And this didn't only extend to sort of the concept. But Richard knew nothing about the way light strikes an object and reflective light and all of these things that artists obsess over getting the physics right. Richard didn't care about physics. He said that straight out. Yeah, I, I don't think this is too complicated for me. So he says, I just go by what feels right. What feels right, what creates the form in my mind. If you look at this, light is coming from a trillion different directions, casting shadows in different places. There's no reason this should make sense, and it makes perfect sense. And he would do it conceptually as well, like talking about religion, for example. He gives a beautiful interpretation. Um, of, of anything, anything. He made sure it went through the filter of how do I feel about this? So a little tiny key into authenticity. Although, David, there you go. <laughs> this was for uh, a Richard Poor Almanac uh, about the neighborhood of mystery. And Richard 
found mysteries in the neighborhoods that you and I walk through oblivious every day. And he just went through and picked out three or four things that, uh, and, and, and turned them into mysteries. So here's a bear tree filled with plastic bags from stores that never were. <laughs> or is there another one in there? Yep. <laughs> You know that house, you've walked by that garbage, <laughs> but you never thought about the mystery involved in it. And, and that's Richard. Same thing, do this have some stores, some of the... Yeah. Yes. <laughs> that's the restaurant. You know, right, we're, you read we're about... Riff, a, we're riffing here, folks. But you read about restaurant closings, and, and you never think twice about it. Richard got a, had a fancy for doing these things, and he just went on and on and on. <laughs> And on. I love these ice cream flavors. Sponge squeezings as an ice cream flavor. And there was no end to it. You kept looking for the bottom. It was like standing under Niagara Falls with a paper cup. He kept coming up with new restaurants all the time. He'd do six to a, a page. I said, where the hell is this coming from? This is not a Richard Thompson caricature. <laughs> and I wish there were some art, uh, I don't know, there may be some artists in the audience, but this is not a Richard Thompson uh, caricature. This is a very good caricature, done, done with tremendous skill, of course, um, and is very, is quite typical of probably 95% of caricature that's out there today. But really the artist, I think, has this is a very limited use of considerable skills because all the artists and many artists today do is turn big, they become distorted cameras. If you can, no, let me click on it. Hold on. See? Again, great skill. And this is all I'm going to do for the next 20 minutes. <laughs> So let me show you how Richard worked, though. He gathered lots of reference. And especially, he gathered how he felt about his subject. This was consistent with everything that he did. And so he had, he, 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 he tapped into this honest feeling, how does Richard feel about a thing? And then he starts finding things. Uh, here's this rather straight, drawing, but you see the mouth, he starts playing with it, he starts thinking about what he's trying to say, and then he makes a leap. Something clicks. On the way to a masterpiece. Now this is his Beethoven, there's no other like it. It's based on his feeling of Beethoven and of Mozart end of Mahler and Hector Berlioz. <laughs> now let me show you these again for a different reason because this is the, the astonishing part. One, that kind of fidelity to authenticity as I said is unique to say the least but these are all basically one-offs meaning he never did another like them in that style. These were all stepping stones on a path to learning. As, as uh, David can tell you, any, or any illustrator, any good illustrator would kill their own mother to be able to settle on one of these styles and say, that's it, I've arrived, this is my style, I'm gonna get hired, look at that. Richard was completely uninterested in that. He learned what he needed to learn and he just moved on. He did one like this, exactly one, only one, and then moved on. He didn't plant his flag there. He knew there was something else. He was headed somewhere else. These are all, in various times of his career, stepping stones to learning. He got a crush on something, and then he just learned it. It satisfied something, and then he moved on. Except for this piece, right here. <laughs> And you see the difference, by the way. 
This was one of, one of the aha pieces in his career. Richard had finally arrived in a place where he had something that had the forethought of structure, but also felt in the moment, had the immediacy and energy, spontaneity. It had both of those things, and that is the holy grail of art. Uh, he had um, arrived at it and started cultivating it. I'm sorry, I'm gonna show you some other stuff because it's from another presentation, I don't mean it. So like this right here uh, became this. As, Richard's like to say, as Richard likes to say, as God intended. <laughs> and so he had something that had everything. He started to, that, that, that started to say what it is he felt. He knew, he knew that these felt in the moment and yet they had, they had the architecture that was necessary to hold up. And they could be elegant. Even though there's a line right through her head, you don't mind it at all. It's beautiful work, and it stands the test of time, and pretty much nobody else can do something like this. Okay. Beautiful, thank you. Um, so I want to give the three of you a chance to say any make any parting observations you might want to make about Richard's work, and then uh, you know we'll go to the mics for a few minutes. Anybody have anything? Uh... Yeah. Richard Thompson, will, this is a little bit of a snobby thing, but Richard Thompson will be appreciated by those that know, and he'll be unappreciated by those that don't. And that second group is a large number. Um, but I'm very, I'm very glad for that first group. Um, he's going to stand the test of time. Uh, he, he, he did something that says, I was here. And he also moved the needle. And that's so rare. And those that know know that. That's Richard the artist. If Richard the person, I could go on in a different way about that. I never liked the bastard. <laughs> I would say that, I mean, cul-de-sac is unlike any other comic strip while also looking, um, like if you had it described to you, you would say, well, of course, that's a comic strip. Like, he makes the joke in the documentary, like a family in suburbia, how original. But, um, like for me, Cul-de-Sac is my favorite comic strip. It's the best comic strip I've ever read. And I read through the archives and I edited them. So I've seen them a lot and they are consistently funny. Like I find new things all the time, um, just in the way that the humor works and everything comes together and that it's, um, it's so yeah, the work speaks for itself and the comic is, um, it, again, it's not for everybody and he's not, you know, it's not accessible. It's not opening its arms to you. It's a, uh, it, it requires work, but it's worth it. When I think about Richard, I think about the uh, philosopher uh, Immanuel Kant and the playwright Henrik Ibsen. Uh, as we all do. <laughs> Immanuel Kant, one of the greatest philosophers in all of history, uh, never lived more than, or moved more than 10 miles away from his home. He just sat at his desk all day long, took a walk every day in the same park, and his neighbors could set their watch by the, the, his daily walk, and yet his mind spanned the cosmos. He sat at that desk and he wrote uh, uh, philosophical works of enduring value. Ibsen, in his formative years, everything he learned, he learned living in a tiny little seaside village and yet ended up writing these classic plays about uh, human psychology because he understood the microcosm of the few village characters around him. And I always think of Richard that way too. Uh, gentle Richard sitting in Arlington, Virginia in a small circle of people but making these astonishing observations about the world and about nature and about uh, uh, people. Uh, things of enduring value, things which I, like Nick, believe will last for uh, uh, you know, a long, long time. People centuries from now will be appreciating his work, in part because the audience that Nick described 
uh, are the influential people, you know, the people working in movie studios, doing uh, uh, multi-million dollar productions, the, the artists who are really shaping the taste, understand and recognize Richard's unique gift. So I'm with you on that. Yeah. He's, the, he's the picture, and he'll, he's the picture of creative authenticity. So we have just a few minutes. Uh, if anybody has any questions for the panelists, uh, that's great. I know that there are lots of people in the audience who knew Richard as well. If anybody has their own reflections, anecdotes, whatever they want to share, uh, we'd love to hear them. The only thing I'd ask is that this is being recorded. So there are mics in the aisles over here. And so if you, if you have a question or something you want to share, please go to one of the mics so that it gets picked up uh, and so that when people watch the recording later, they can hear, hear what you have to say. So anybody? Kate comes the star of our movie. Yeah. <laughs> Hi, everyone. I'm Caitlin McGurk. I'm the uh, very poorly dressed person that's visiting uh, Richard's house and looking through his collection. I curated his exhibit at Ohio State, and um, I won't say a lot, but uh, I will say that that was one of the most difficult things for me to do, because um, not only had I never previously gotten to meet him, and I was flying out there to look through all of his <laughs> tremendous body of work, uh, but, um, but it was also my, my very first exhibit. And um, this is kind of a strange thing to say, but uh, the plan was for me to go out there and to sit with Richard in his studio and to look through everything. Um, and then he broke his hip the day before I got there. So I didn't get to sit with him. And in some ways, I am so glad <laughs> that he could not have been there for it because it was me going through, I mean, just an immense amount of work and loving every single piece and trying to curate a show where you want to put in over a thousand things is very difficult. So uh, I hope that I get to curate many more shows of his work. Um, a lot of his originals now live at, at the Billy Ireland Cartoon Library Archive, and I think we will be doing that in the future. Um, and lastly, if, if there's anyone here who hasn't read Cold de Sac, um, please do. And I think one of the most important things, and I'm trying to, to get emotional, <laughs> for me is that when you read that comic, if you haven't yet, it will help you remember your own life. And that's, I think, probably one of the most profound like powers that it has is, you know, whether you know you knew Richard or had a similar, you know. Uh, relationship with your family that or, or not there are just these intricate details some of which David talked to that like it's like sparks and flashbacks and things that you thought were gone that he uh, so brilliantly you know breathes life into these memories that are universal and it's uh, it's just a wonderful thing uh, like Sheena even though we're probably in our positions not supposed to say this it's my favorite comic strip <laughs> it's the best I say it all the time yeah all right good <laughs> solidarity so thank you Richard and thanks, everyone. Thank you, Caitlin. You know, as Richard became more immobilized toward the end, as Caitlin was saying, um, uh, most of the luminaries in the business made a pilgrimage to visit Richard. And we had many great evenings sitting around the yeah. kitchen table at Richard's house eating the most disgusting food imaginable. <laughs> Richard used to like orange food, which meant Cheetos, orange soda, corn nuts, and pizza. <laughs> and it took years off of our lives. If it, did, if it didn't come in a styrofoam box or a cellophane bag, he really wasn't interested. Oh my God. Uh, uh, Mike Rody, you survived many of those dinners. You should, you should uh, have something to contribute on this. Richard, but, and, Richard, yeah. Richard and I had a funny, sort of a regular exchange over, you know, like I, I'd have something, especially when we were working on the book, and every once in a while I would bring something to eat. Um, and he'd just look over all excited. What is that? <laughs> and I'd go, like I said, Richard, this is called a leafy green vegetable. <laughs> and it's full of antioxidants. And I'm not giving it to you because that's going to be the thing that kills you. <laughs> and he'd laugh. <laughs> Richard used to love these milkshakes that would make your arteries harden if you came within 10 feet of them. And once, Nick decided to get tricky and to slip a little, ensure a little vitamin, a little protein content into the milk, just a tiny little bit to, to give him a little nutrition. And with the first sip, 
he got this stricken look on his face. He was aghast, like his friends were plotting against him. He could he tell. Knew. He knew. He had no more nerve sensation. His nerve endings were gone, but he could tell instantly that someone was trying to give him a vitamin. Yeah. And he turned. That's right. He turned on Nick. You know. You, yeah. You, There's something healthy in here. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and yeah, he's a, but you get Pete Doctor who came in from Hollywood, the big Pixar, uh, you know, the, the the art director, the director for uh, Inside Out. You get Bill Waterson who came regularly and came out of hiding to, yeah. to visit Richard. John Cuneo came down from Stephen New York. Stephen Passed those for us for Scott McLeod wanted, went. Everyone yeah. wanted to come by and visit Richard. Yeah. Amy, I'm shocked you didn't barricade the door. All those <laughs> low lives <laughs> scratching at your door. Yeah. I want to see Richard. <laughs> Yeah, and a lot of a lot of people it made the effort, and, uh, and it was quite a it was quite a quite a thing, and that was a great reward. Um, yeah, Richard was not one when he was actively working to sort of, he, you know, he he got a piece into the Society of Illustrators annual, which you know illustrators did die to do, and and uh, it was that Perot gopher head, I, uh, and. And uh, so, you know you have to do all this stuff after you're accepted into it. You know you have to have reproduction made and send it all like that. And Rich's like, yeah, the, yeah, I'll do, didn't do any of it. <laughs> he was on to he was too busy working on a hundred and fifty dollar association piece and pouring his heart in. He didn't do it. He didn't do any of it. So in the annual, you can see they ran the reproduction of the newsprint. <laughs> <laughs> yes. The only one in the whole probably the history of their yeah, annual. Yeah. Thing. yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, the, so, so these people visiting him, and uh, say, and and paying their respects was, that was quite a nice thing. That was a, you know, a great, great. When when Bill Watterson first emailed him, Richard immediately sent me the email, and I sorry wrote back. I said, no award you've ever won or will ever win will equal, equal this. Yeah. You know, you made J D. Salinger speak in public. <laughs> Anybody else want to? A joke Bill would hate, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> Questions? Anything? So, we traumatized our young visitor up there with the I think profanity. He's, I think he's asleep. <laughs> uh, so, I just want to apologize now for um, anybody. Uh, an audience who does a comic on magic tugboats with vampire <laughs> captains. Um, I'm sure it's hey, really good. Like uh, um, uh, and just in closing, I just want to thank these three uh, on this panel who uh, just brought such erudition and good humor and uh, just passion uh, to the discussion. Uh, they're all great people. What panel was that, Joe? It's, the, it's a fanographics one, the 40th anniversary. Um, I hear, heard it was great. So, uh, thank you all for coming, and uh, have a good evening.